ഹലോ Good morning, good morning. We've talked the whole night. Good morning, good morning to you and you. Hello. My, my creative version of a sound check. Okay, so, you know, we have half the hall full, right? So it means that half of our friends are still downstairs. Now, if you have anyone downstairs uh, who is still waiting to come up, phones Can you see this this web address right on top Okay I'll read it to you it's http colon forward slash forward slash like any website and then it goes to capital T V dot arch k l a r c h k l k l dot o r g now You know how many of you are here today? 600 people. Amazing, right? Now, do you know how many people are not here today? In the thousands. They are downstairs. They are coming in. They are calling. They are messaging. Because there is no available space for them. So it's very important for you now. to type this address on your whatsapp and just forward it on to everyone because it's a live broadcast it means that it only happens today from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. so if you've got your phones whatsapp this address to everyone that you can okay so that whoever's missing out they get to come uh, they get to watch us on youtube now do you know what that means that also means that we are live you know it's a live broadcast so everybody behave everybody smile everybody you know your best face and foot forward okay okay um now there's a very beautiful lady who's supposed to help me but she is not here so i shall um do this all on my own one man show one woman show okay okay so i've got four things to announce to you today very important things now i know jesus christ goes and takes five loaves and two fish and it's enough for him to hold a archdiocese and mental health day function and event but we don't do that we need a lot of money we've reduced the the fee for this year so that we can have more people access this wonderful day but we do need a lot of your contribution if you have extra change i'm talking about you know whatever is shaking in your wallet whatever that you didn't iron you know all the notes you didn't iron those notes please put them in there will be a collection box going around later and there will be uh, some downstairs at the registration counter if you want to give a contribution get someone in a blue t-shirt to help you with it okay uh the second very important thing and this helps us make things better is a feedback form now in your folder and everybody has a folder today you will have a feedback form that requires you to give an evaluation after every talk plenary session workshop so and it's so easy i mean it's a tick 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 and done so please give us your feedback and if you have things to write please write it on the feedback form because you make it happen better next time and write anything because we really want to hear it okay okay so that's the second very important thing that we want from you you know about this you know about the live broadcast get this address down put it in your phone whatsapp it to everyone that you can and then switch your phone off and throw it out the window okay 
<laughs> okay, uh, we, we have a lot of people to thank to, you know, for making this event happen. Uh, but two uh, particular sponsors that have helped us with the t-shirts that the crew members are wearing is uh, Mr. John Go um, and Mr. Dexter from Light Bulb Apparel. And they've helped us to sponsor these wonderful blue t-shirts. Okay. Um. Okay, that's the end of my one-man show. Now, can I tell you something about this man, uh, Father Philip Chua? Uh, Jamie, let me tell you something. I used to think he must think that all of us are fairies because he makes these just impossible demands like, let's get from 250 people last year, let's get 500 people in a room. And we all think it's impossible, but today morning I realize uh, he has faith and he has foresight. And um, we are blessed to have him. He is our ecclesiastical um, um, advisor, Father Philip Chua. Thank you very much. And please come and, um, to give a few words. Good morning, my dear friends, especially to His Grace, uh, our Bishop Julian Liao, for taking your time to come here this morning. Our guest speaker, presenters, volunteers, and all of you who are present here this morning, we are indeed very happy and thankful to have you all here with us for the Art Diocesan Mental Health Day, which the Ministry has organized for the second consecutive years. This only made possible by the grace of God, and we are grateful to God for setting up, also for His grace, for setting up the mental health ministry to reach out to the lost, the least, the little, and the last in our community, and also for the, all our people of our faith. Since our humble beginning in 2015, Mental Health Ministry has grown leaps and bounds with assistance and collaboration from a balanced mix of counsellors, uh, psychotherapists, medical professionals and volunteers. Besides providing psychological support through our mental health centres, we feel that there is an urgent need to give psychoeducation to our community with mental health issues, knowledges, skills, which may be affecting them. And therefore, the Mental Health Day, the Art Does the Mental Health Day, was born from this. And this year, we managed to bring many presenters in four languages who are experts in their own field with their rich experiences and knowledge and sound research. To name a few, we are glad to have with us Associate Professor Dr. Anna Suya, who is a psychologist that specializes in technology, technology, that is the science of death, as one of our guest speakers, and she will be presenting on the topic of grief and loss, which is very important for all of us. We have also invited guest speakers for other languages other than English. For we understand that many are eager to learn, to know about mental health, but are proficient in language other than English. Reflecting on this year's Art Does the Mental Health Day, our theme is pain is real, so as hope. As a human person, we cannot escape from experiencing pain, but we too are inseparable from God's love and mercy. Our Lord Jesus himself has proved to us that even the greatest pain of crucifixion and death for a bird to fly for a bird to fly effectively it needs to have a pair of wings and for us man to live effectively he needs 
to have faith and reason. It is hoped that with faith in God, as well as psychological tools and knowledge, we are able to manage our pain more effectively, and therefore providing hope not only to ourselves, but we too become the source of hope to our brothers and sisters in our community. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you who are here and for those who have contributed your time and effort. I do hope that you will gain more insight and knowledge from the topics from the workshop that we are presenting today, which we presented by our distinguished presenters. And last of all, I'd like to thank all of you for being present. Praise the Lord for coming for this other mental health day. And let us stand and we give a short prayer. We start with a short prayer and ask God for blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this beautiful day that you gathered us together for this other mental health day. We humbly implore for your help and grace, for your blessing to each one of us who are here this morning. May your grace and wisdom be with us so that we can go through with our lives with hope, with your grace and your blessing. And Mother Mary asks you to pray and this for us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Philip. I would like to now invite His Grace, Archbishop Julian Lau, to present us with a few words. Archbishop. Selamat pagi semua. Kalai Vanakam. Chauan. Good morning. That's all the interpretation in the other languages for my speech. Huh? Uh, firstly, I'd like to congratulate hmm, Father Philip Chua and his team for organizing this. Mental Health Day seminar that brings children, adults, youth together in this, not only in this hall, but it's telecasted on YouTube also. So many are watching, many are listening. So we dedicate this day to this important event, mental health, that is affecting all of us. I just like to see a show of hands. How many know? How many of us here know what is Tanjong Rambutan? <laughs> Why do you all laugh? Huh? Okay, only about thirty percent. Huh? The rest may not know what is Tanjong Rambutan. Uh, it is not a place where you buy rambutans. Uh. The laughter shows that we have a funny impression of this place. Tanjong Rambutan, when we were growing up, is a place where we say mad people go there. Mad people. It's a mental asylum. But today, do we know that more than 350 million people in the world and more than 4 million in Malaysia are suffering some kind of mental illness? 30%. Huh? So those 30% who put up your hand, that is the number that today is suffering from some sort of depression, some sort of mental illness. It could be you, it could be me, in some point of our lives. All of us go through stress, depression. So my dear friends, I'm happy to see 
600 of you here wanting to learn more about what is this mental health all about. And not only knowing what it is it about, not only trying to help others, maybe we ourselves need help. Maybe we ourselves are in this category of mental health that we need mental help. So it is good today that we withhold judgment that when you hear Tanjong Rambutan, it shouldn't bring about laughter but care and concern for those who may be going through. And mental health does not just affect the poor or we may think only certain categories, maybe only old people, maybe only the poor, maybe only certain groups of people. No. Mental health affects everybody, from children, because we are giving them so much of stress. Huh? PT3 just finished, right? I think the parents are more relieved than the children. Huh? Parents go through more stress than their children during exam times. And it affects everybody. Race doesn't see race, doesn't see age, doesn't see ethnic groups, social status. It affects the poor as much as the rich, maybe more the rich. So today, we want to create more awareness. We want to create more awareness about this mental illness. What are the causes? I think we have had past years. What are the signs? What are the symptoms? How to detect, how to prevent, how to sympathize, how to console one another those who are going through mental illness. Scripture says, Psalm 25, verses 16 to 17, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. This could be the prayer, not just of the psalmist calling on God to deliver him from the affliction and the distress he is feeling. It is the same cry that mental, those who are experiencing mental pressures, mental illness, are also crying out, are also crying out to God and to you and to me. And how do we engage? How do we approach? How do we encounter these kinds of cries in our society, in our community? It is with compassion. It is with tenderness. We need to help those who are crying out. <clears throat> so, my dear friends, today I hope that we can overcome some of these prejudices, stereotyping, some of these fears that we may have. What do I do if there's a mental patient sitting beside me? Will he become violent? Will he attack me? Will he or she do something to me, to my children? We stereotype those with mental illness, with violence sometimes. So today, I hope we will study, we will go through the workshops that have been provided for us, for children of different ages, for different language groups, 
so that we may be able to listen in our own languages and understand better. I apologize, I cannot interpret in four languages now, not because I can't speak, but because of time limitation. Huh? And I hope maybe this being videotaped, this being on YouTube, we could have subtitles maybe later on the different things that are happening so that we can all appreciate and learn and gain from today's um, sessions. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened. Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Let us also look at those who are overburdened with pressures at work, in school, the pressures that our children are subjected to today is much more during our days. Those over 16, I understand, the statistics say that approximately 30% of Malaysians above the age of 16 suffer depression. 30% of 30 million is 10 million. One third of our population are experiencing some kind of depression. So today, as we celebrate Archdiocesan Mental Health Day, let us do our bit to educate ourselves about mental illness. Let us listen to the different sharings, the experiences of those who have suffering or have suffered from this illness. How do we prepare the road to recovery and the ways that I can be supportive of my fellow community members, my own family members? How can I support someone who is going through mental illness? And so, my dear friends, let us begin today. The change must begin with me one person at a time, one day at a time, to help those who are suffering. And let us pray together that those who are at the margins of society, those that have been pushed to the fringes, can be brought back to the centre, can be embraced, can be helped, can be assisted to be companions, we be companions to them on this journey because it can be very lonely, it can be very scary to go through these illnesses alone, not being understood by others. Let us today Dedicate this day to the Lord and let us pray for all our speakers that they will be able to share their experiences and that we will be able to learn. We will be able to empathize with those that we ourselves will know how to deal with this mental illness that affects all of us to a certain extent. And so, with the permission of Father, I would now like to declare this Archdiocesan Mental Health Day open. Thank you very much, Your Grace for giving us insight into how we need to be and approach mental health in 2017. And this is wonderful. Now, are we all ready for treats 
and for nourishment. Yes? Okay. Okay. So, um, what we have in store is um, a plenary session on how to deal with loss and grief in everyday life. And you know what they say, every single one of us has experienced loss. Um, and who we have to take us to this part of the session is Associate Professor Dr. Anasuya Jagadevi Jagadesan. She is the academic head of the Masters in Counseling program in the HELP University. She's a licensed counselor in Malaysia, a thanatologist, a certified reality therapist. She served for over 100 hours on site during the MH370 crisis. She's conducted grief workshops in Malaysia, Singapore, the United States, and South America. And she is the founder and president of the William Glazer Association of Malaysia. She's earned a doctorate in counseling from the University of South Australia and holds a double master's in education and business administration. Now, we are privileged. May I please welcome Dr. Anasuya. Thank you. A uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, that was... Uh, Wow, very long introduction. Uh, my students call me Dr. A and I'm fine with that. So that's the short, short version of, uh, of everybody. Good afternoon, morning, good, sorry, good morning, Father. Okay, uh, so we're talking about grief and loss. Uh, where's the, who's clicking on the slides for the computer? Yeah, okay. So we're talking about grief and loss and I have a translator to translate into uh, Chinese for me. He's actually one of my students in the Masters in Counseling program. Uh, so thank you very much for translating. You want to say hello for everybody? Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I thought uh, you said... Hello. Okay. Uh, uh. Yeah, the Chinese <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. Grief is one of those things in mental health which everybody experiences. Every one of us who is born, we have a checkout date. We, we are, on the day we are born and the day we die, that's in the Lord's hands. Nobody kind of can tell exactly which day you're going to pass on. But we can tell that in our lifetime, there will be people who will pass on in this lifetime. This is a very big audience, so it has to be more of a lecture than a workshop. But I will be trying to do some activities with you all as well. So it's not just a one-way thing. So for when I do the activity part, please do try to participate. Uh, 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 so okay. Next slide. Skip. Okay, that. Now, in Malaysia, we have many different religions. And many of us have family and friends from these different religions. The thing that unites us is we are Malaysians. The thing that joins us together is that when we experience grief, it's a universal experience of grief. Uh, 三大种族，然后有四个比较主要的宗教。那么，呃，可是，在北上来讲呢，是每一个种族或者是宗教都会去经历的一些事情。But although you know from the time we are born, death is normal. It is still a taboo. Many families never speak about death. It's bad luck, but it's a part of life. There is no life without death. If nobody died in our families, there wouldn't be a reason for the next generation. Death is inherently a part of life. It is an inescapable part of life. 
And with death comes grief. And grief is also, unfortunately, a natural part of life. It's a challenge, it's part of the process, it's what we have to go through as human beings. All of us, uh, no, sorry, up uh, just now. When we go through death, and, we, and we've experienced death, and we have grief in our families, and we have grief among our friends, one thing, we all go through high stress. We all go through trauma. Translate this part. Uh, when you have a death and you have grief and you're going through the grieving process, do not mistake it for depression. Depression is separate from grief. Grief is a loss of someone you love, loss of someone you, you know, you have feelings for in your life. Complicated love sometimes. And so when that person dies, it is hard to get over the death. Because no matter what you do, they are no longer there. The physical body is gone. So without the physical body there, we are going to miss that person. And nowadays, what do people try to do? As soon as they experience pain, instead of accepting it as part of the challenge of living, as part of you know, the process of becoming more human, more spiritual, more realized, they take pills very fast. Oh, I'm not supposed to feel bad. With death and grief, the unfortunate thing is that if you lost somebody and then you decide to take pills or self-medicate, maybe even some people beyond pills, they choose alcohol, they choose other things to self-medicate. What happens is the grief is still there. It doesn't go away. So when you stop taking the pills, when you stop, when you want to stop the alcohol, guess what comes back? The grief. It comes back and it comes back really strong because it is a process that we need to go through to integrate that person who is no longer physically in our lives to a spiritual place in our lives. We have to integrate that person into our inner minds. So that while their body is not there, their heart is still inside us. Their spirit is still inside us. And it is a source of healing, not devastation. Uh, so when you have when you are going through grief, it is a complex process. And let me tell you this. Everybody who is spiritually inclined prays in times of grief. Everybody prays, everybody reaches out. But the interesting thing about the prayer is Everybody prays slightly differently. People pray in their own way and according to their own relationship with the divine. Hindus pray, Christians pray, Muslims pray. The content, the fact that we pray, that is universal. But how we pray, what we pray for, that is not only unique to religions, 
it is unique to you and your relationship with the divine how do you speak to god how do you communicate your emotions to god in that communication that is your personal strength and for some people personal healing in dealing with their grief 祈祷最主要的一个功用就是呃帮助我们去度过这个悲伤，然而里面的一些祈祷的方式，或者是呃你跟死亡死者的一些关系的不一样，会造成这个祈祷有不一样的一个呃功能。So I wanted to start off、uh, this session with this because it's with the church, with showing people that grief. Is part of that process that brings us together as human beings. It cuts across all religions. It cuts across all races. It cuts across everything. It, in a way, it unites people. And if you remember, during MH370, it was pray for MH370, and it was a cry that was heard all over Malaysia, uniting Malaysians. So grief is not something. That is taboo. It is not something that you should stop the discussion on. It is not something that you go, oh, don't speak about grief. It is something that can unite and bring together families. It is something that can unite and bring together nations, because it is a common experience. No spiritual master of any religion. Ever promised us that we would not have pain in our lives. What they promised is that you are not alone. Is that we can come together? Is that there is more that you can reach out for, and a feeling of something reaching back for us? That is grief. And if we can come together when we have grief and loss, then we are much stronger. As individuals, as families, and as a nation. 祈祷是呃可以重播宗教跟那个种族的。那么呃，我们不应该避忌的去谈论这个悲伤跟这个哀悼，因为哀悼啊，它是可以呃协助大家去面对呃更多的一些哀伤。那么呃。很多的宗教其实都没有说明说我们的生命是没有痛苦的，我们是可以走过这个呃痛苦的。Okay, so now having spoken of slightly spiritual aspects of grief, every group and every culture slightly, even every religion has different ways of having rituals and prayers. Nowadays, when it comes to grief, people do this. Oh, I don't want a big funeral. I want a very small funeral, and I will dictate how I want the funeral. And sometimes they don't even want religious services to go with the funeral.、Um, but you see, the funeral is not for the dead. It is for the living. Our ancestors were not stupid people. Our ancestors were highly intelligent. They were highly feeling people. They were highly capable people, and they could see that the rites and rituals surrounding death was for the living, probably more than for the dead, who is already in the hands of the divine. So it is for the living that we do these rituals. 那么死亡会产生一种啊无助感跟啊让你让人难以承受的一种感觉。那么我们可以透过啊、呃、仪式或者是葬礼呢，去呃走过这个过程。Okay. Just before I go into that a little bit, I want to talk about the feelings that you have on grief. Now, because I was talking about the title is how you experience grief in everyday life, and、um, seeing the crowd, doing slightly something different. I want to ask you all. Just think. How do you experience grief? How do you experience grief of somebody who died ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago? Now, my mum, she died when I was twenty-two. That's about twenty years ago, and that's all I'm going to say. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm sort of not that young. I look that young, thank you, but I'm not. Okay. <laughs> that one don't need to translate. Okay. <laughs> but my mom died. And even till today, there are some moments in a year, or sometimes, when suddenly I remember her. Usually I'm walking and you know, the sunlight through the branches of the tree or at night when there's a problem and it just feels like I need my mummy, okay? And suddenly I remember my mum and it feels like she died yesterday. It feels like she died two minutes ago. And the grief comes like a hammer. Just that part. <laughs> From, I need to translate which part. <laughs> just the, just the, 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 okay. Just that the grief, okay. The very far, the, the part that needs to be translated is that when people die, although it may be very long time ago, suddenly we can experience grief from nowhere. And the grief is experienced very strongly, as if the person just recently passed away. Okay. Uh, for us, we have already lost a close friend, even though that time has been gone, but it can still be there in our mind. And that feeling is like a now, I want to tell you, when you experience that moment, many of us think, what's wrong with me? I'm not over my grief. I should stop doing this. And then you think, oh my God, what, you know, I, maybe I'm getting depression. You're wrong. That is grief. When we get to this kind of feeling, we will ask ourselves, 我是不是又在经历这个哀伤？我是不是还没有走过去这个哀伤？我是不是患上了这个呃忧郁症？而其实这一个不不是忧郁症。You see, the thing about grief in that, no matter how long we live, you see, the thing about grief in that, no matter how long we live, the person that we love, they're gone. The heart remembers. The heart remembers every moment. The heart remembers every feeling. It's locked in the heart. So in those times when the heart feels they miss that person, the memory comes back and with that memory, the emotions. This is actually called a stug, a sudden traumatic upsurge of grief. It has a proper name for it even. But, okay, translate. Translate. <laughs> 我们的爱人已经失去了，而我们对他们是有存在的爱以及一些思念，所以他们啊会时常会在我们的脑海中出现。So when we have this moment of upsurge of grief, there are people nowadays who say, "Oh, something is wrong with me. I need to go and see the doctor. I need to go and meet people like me." Actually, at that point, you don't. At that point, what you need to do is respect how much you are capable of loving somebody. Respect how much that person meant to you personally in your heart. That 20 years later, at times, you miss them so much. So when I have these moments when it comes, what I do? I say a prayer, I write a poem, I do something funny on Facebook for the person who passed away. And it's a moment of reverence. It's a moment of memory. It's a moment of love, not grief. But it's a moment of love that is remembered through grief. When these feelings come out, we should not be judgmental. We should be able to think about this thing. Because we love that person. So through this grief, we can do some things to make it better. 啊，事情就是好像说一些例子，就是啊，写诗或者是啊，写 Facebook 一些，就写 Facebook 的 status 给那个亲人，然后去度过这个哀伤。Okay, thank you. So that is one of the things about experiencing grief of somebody who passed away very long time ago. People who pass away now, we have all the funeral services. Okay, 
I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about funeral services because that is another part of our everyday experience. Now, how many of you, you can just show out your hands or if you can shout out, during funerals, when you have a funeral and you are experiencing a funeral, what are some of the things that people have said that are helpful or not helpful? How many of you have experienced not helpful things that are said by well-wishers and people who are visiting during funerals? Can you please put up your hand? Anybody? Come on. Oh, yes. A few people. Okay, the rest of you are shy. I don't know. How many of you, everybody said very good things? Nobody said any bad things. Very good. I like your family. Very good. Now, when my mom died, because she died suddenly, a lot of things people said. She was quite young when she passed away, and she passed away um, of a brain aneurysm, so it was very sudden. And people were saying all kinds of things which were less than helpful. Are you joking? Uh, no, I'm going to joke about my mother dying. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing. Actually, people ask me on the phone, are you joking? I'm like, um, do you even know how to answer that? Okay, <laughs> sorry. From, from which part? <laughs> just, just that, what do, what do people say during funerals? Okay. Uh, yeah, we're doing that, we're talking about that. Okay, 就是有一些人在葬礼的时候会说一些不一样的话语 然后Dr. Ed的例子就是说当他的妈妈去世的时候 他打电话跟他的朋友说就告知他们说我的妈妈去世了可是对方回应他说这是一个笑话吗然后Dr.S不懂要怎样回应对方 Funerals, when it's tragic deaths Unexpected and tragic deaths that's sometimes the hardest for to know what to say to somebody. 很多时候我们在葬礼的时候，因为啊情绪的不一样，所以我们很难去啊，或者是不懂怎样去表达这一些情绪跟感觉。Most of us during a funeral, when the person is crying, we'll say, you know, my condolences. Now, my condolences is probably the safest thing to say. If you're going to say, you know, this, my condolences, it's the safest thing to say. I am here, my condolences, safest thing to say. Some of the things that we should not say. Wait, say that first, then no translate. I keep, sorry, I'm not so used to having translators, so I have to keep remembering. Okay, in the funeral, we often hear that my condolences is that my condolences is the most safe thing to say. It's also safe. Things which are not helpful. Asking somebody who has just lost someone, how are you? Now, if you have ever done that, please go home, wash your mouth with soap. Uh, 在葬礼会听到一些不, uh, 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 why do you ask that question? Because we want to hear the answer. I'm fine. So that we can smile, not shake their hands and move away. Please don't do that to those who are grieving. Because many people will answer, I'm fine. Because they know that's what you want to hear. But inside, they're not fine. You are making them say it for your sake. You're not making them say it for their sake. So don't, please, one thing not to say is how you know how are you how are you feeling all those all those questions in the category just don't say it you know how they are feeling you know they are not feeling good you know they are feeling sad why do you need to ask why do you need to poke okay number 1 uh 我们会这样子问是因为我们自己本身也不大 知道怎么去应对，我们希望对方打我很好，然后自己就悄静悄悄的走开。所以很多时候是因为啊，怕自己会被感染到一些不好的情绪或者是负面的情绪，所以才会问这个问题。然后啊，即使是这样，我们也是
the lie. What is the lie? The lie is, it's going to be okay. It's not. The person is never coming back. It's never going to be okay the way it was. It is always going to hurt. You're always going to miss this person. So when somebody says, it's going to be okay, really? Are they coming back tomorrow for it to be okay? It's only going to, become, going to be okay if my child is in my arms. It is only going to be okay if my husband is hugging me. It is only going to be okay if my mom is cooking in the kitchen and giving me food. It is only going to be okay if my, if my father is giving me a hug. It is only going to be okay if that person came back. So when we say, especially if we're helping people, it is going to be okay. It is a lie. It's never going to be okay again. It's going to be different. You're going to have a different sense of normal. You will find a new kind of normal for yourself. But you're never okay the way you were when your loved one was alive. True? Yes. Uh, 你会一切会变好的一切其实是不会变好因为那个人已经是不在了那个人已经是去世了所以我们应该要说的是有一些东西已经是改变了我们要换一个方式去说这个东西改变那个人已经是不在我们需要去适应这个事情 So this is actually the part in the slides I know how you feel they are in a better place now, this one I have to speak of because when I've seen it with children, deaths of children, there are certain things you can say in a sermon that perhaps need not be said to a grieving parent. You didn't know yet? Sorry. Okay. So one of the things is when people, when young children die, when you say something like to a mum, They've heard it in the... They, they know. People, cognitively, they know that the child is with God, it's in a better place and all that. But while people are grieving, this is not working very, hard, very well. This is working over time. This is scarred. This is in pain. You don't put salt on a wound when the wound is bleeding. This actually happened. This small story actually happened. Can I say Oh, wait, no, I'll tell the story, then you can translate. Okay, I'm, 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 sorry, I'm sorry about the trans... I'm going to apologize to the translator on this story because it's a story, I don't know how to, how to break it up. Um, this, a, a, a mother lost a child of two, and during the funeral, a lot of people went up and said, you know, God, you know, God wants children, you know, God, want, God loves the, the, the young die early, you know, God, needs, God needed another angel in heaven, and repeated this so many times. She was in the middle, she was in front of the whole audience. Somebody said it and something broke in the mum. And the mum exploded. I love my child. I want my child here. Why does God have to take my child? In front of everybody. And you know, 90, 80% of the audience, let me be kind, 80% of the audience understood and took that well. 20% went, Oh, how could she do that? How could she say that? Her spirituality is so low. And added to the problem. Because the mouth. Cannot control the mouth. Must go to the lowest common denominator. Honestly, it is already hard enough. But when you're putting a parent in competition with God at the point of a death of a child, Perhaps we should rethink what we're going to say. Perhaps you should rethink how you want to approach it. Because at that point, here is painful. So they need time to reconnect. They don't need you telling them and putting God in competition and to a certain extent, blaming God. All right? So these are one of the things where we have to be compassionate in how we deal and understand that people in pain 
don't need to hear platitudes. They need to hear that they are together with the community. And for God's sake, please, 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 when people break down and people say strange things during funerals, if people get angry with God, if people get angry with the pastors, people get angry with you, understand that it's not you they're angry with. Understand they're in pain. It is their pain talking. So respond from that love. Even though they may be in pain, your love is what helps heal. Okay. Good Lama. luck. <laughs> okay. Um. 很多时候我们会以一个宗教的角度去呃看待刚刚失去亲人的人，就是我们会以宗教角度说，哎，这个可能是天主的一个旨意，呃，你你可以去呃走过这个悲伤。那么很多时候，当我们失去亲人的时候，我们的脑部是比较不能够呃健全的去思考，然后因为我们的心很痛，就是情感跟心都很痛很痛，所以我们无法很正确的去思考。当别人说，哎。听到这一种奇怪的话语的时候呢，我们会很愤怒。然后，呃，当这个愤怒呢发泄在给予安慰的人来说，那安慰人可能会不理解为什么他会有这样的一个愤怒，所以呢，会可以后会可能会造成一种啊误会。所以，当我们去出席葬礼的时候呢，呃，尽量避免以一个宗教的角度去啊安慰刚刚失去亲人的人。OK， 呃、uh, ，Go down this one, no need. This one, um. No, go further down. Go further down. Okay, uh, go up again. Up again. I'll, I'll talk about this afterwards. Oh, what thirty? Okay, oh, thirty more minutes. Wow, that was fast. Okay, because the translator is taking up a lot of my time. So I'm going to say one more thing. I, before that means I I want to stop here. Wait, let's just do. Let me do something. What can you do then during a funeral? Now, number one, just be compassionate. And number two, sometimes words get in the way. Sometimes words actually spoil the communication, and I would like to prove that now by getting everybody to do a small activity. If you're with a family member, you turn to that family member, not the youngest of the children. Eh? If they're above 12, that's fine. But if they're below 12, it might be a bit hard for them. Okay, so I'd like you to 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 pair up with somebody. Just turn to one person. All right. Now, don't say anything. Just look at okay. Just just pair up with somebody. If they're a family member, it's good. If they're not a family member, that's also fine. You're all family in Christ, okay? So just pair up with somebody. And I want you, without speaking, to look into their eyes. I'm just going to count two minutes. Two minutes. If especially if they're family members, especially husband and wife, I'd really like y'all to do this. <laughs> without speaking. Look into each other's eyes and do this. With your eyes, tell the person if they are family. I love you. You are a wonderful person. Just with your eyes. The message is, I love you. You are a wonderful person. Thank you for being in my life. If they are, if they are somebody you don't know so well, they are through the church. You know, they are your friend. With your eyes, you say, I see you. I respect you. I love you as a human being. All right. If you're a family member, a bit more intimate. If you're not family member, then I respect you as a human being. I see you. Turn to each other. I'm going to time two minutes. Look into their eyes, without laughing. Try it without laughing. Go. Time. Take a deep breath. Look into somebody's eyes. Two minutes. Change position quickly. Change. Yes, come, come, come. We are timing. No speaking. Just look in the eyes. Don't break eye contact. Let the emotions flow. All of y'all who are talking, you're hiding. Look at the human behind the words. Look at the person. If you're family members, look at the person behind the words. If you're friends, look at the soul beneath that. Look at each other. Say, say in Chinese. Look at each other. 
呃，大家互相望着对方的眼睛，佛大概两分钟，不不需要讲话，只是静静的望着对方就可以了。Not yet, even two minutes, sir.、Eh? How much more? One minute? Huh? That was only one minute. One more minute. How long do you all stare at TVs? How long do you stare at your hand for iPhones? You cannot look into somebody's eyes for two minutes. Come on, look in your family's eyes. Two, one more minute. Just one minute, sixty seconds. Look. Don't look at me. Look in your family's eyes. Look at your friend's eyes. See the human. Okay, and that was just two minutes. For those who need to hug, hug it out. For those who are family members, you all need to hug, hug it out. I want you just this. Can you feel that person and how important that is to connect? Words sometimes get in the way. You all open your mouth. Most of us open our mouth. Insert foot. The eyes are the windows of the soul. We forget how to use that. We are so busy staring at this that two minutes of looking at somebody in the eye is so hard. And some of you must talk, must run away from the emotions because it was emotional, right? To look at somebody in the eye. If parents can do that with their teenagers every once in a while, stop the words and see the human, and the hu and the child can see the human in you. You will change your relationship. I can tell you that one, okay? No. So, when you have grief and loss, if you could see just from that how important it is to be human. Don't worry about what you have to say. Go there, look into their eyes, say "I am here," and give them a hug. That is sometimes the most important thing you can do during a funeral. Another very important thing you can do during a funeral, if you're going to a funeral house, where it's somebody's house, most of us when we have funerals, we are not planned. It's not planned. The funeral just happens. If you are If you are close to that person and you're not, you know, directly part of the family, just do this. If you ask them what do they need, they will say nothing. I'm fine. You need to ask specific questions. I know people who who have not drank for over 24 hours because somebody passed away. It was very traumatic. They were in the hospital. They were this. They were that. They were doing. They were on the run. They just forgot to drink. And everybody asked them, "How are you?" Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Until somebody asked, "When was the last time you had a drink?" Oh, oh, yesterday. When did you eat? I can't remember. Because the people are running on energy. So when you're asking a question about the welfare of people who are in grief, do not ask general questions. Ask specific questions. Do you? When was the last time you had a drink? When was the last time you? Had some food. When was the last time you had a bath? And then, if they need, and you can organize it, help them organize. Another one you can do during a funeral, which is very, very useful, and people always forget. People will go and buy water. That one people do in Malaysia. A lot of people immediately go and buy water for the guests and for the people who are visiting and the people who are giving、uh, respect. They forget whatever comes in must come out. The toilet. Is there toilet paper? 
Do you really expect the grieving to remember about toilet paper? So what I generally suggest to people, if you really know the people and you really want to be helpful, when you go to the toilet, clean it a bit. And then check, is there extra toilet paper? Is there no toilet paper? Quietly go, you don't have to ask. If you see it's running out or it's low, just quietly go and buy one or two and just put it there. It is so useful and so helpful. And you don't have to tell people you're doing it. Because it's one of the things people forget. That nobody's expecting a death and everybody needs to use the toilet sooner or later. And this is that, you know, usually our houses are not meant for 100 people to use. But we've got 100 guests coming through. So those are some of the things that we can help as, you know, people who are coming and if you want to help but you don't know what to say. Because nine times out of ten, you ask people, how are you? I'm fine. Do you need anything? No, it's fine. Everything is taken care of. All the, you know, motto is going. The words are coming out manually. Now 地方说比方说厕所的话 I hope you understand that, you know, it's, you know, people don't usually talk about toilets during, talk, during talks like this. But I'm talking about grief in everyday life. And all of us experience funerals, and all of us usually are not prepared for it. Okay? Okay, next one. No, this one. Now, if you Google grief, this is what comes out. Or oh, that you got bargaining, you got depression, you got transcendence. Now, this is fake. This is all research. It doesn't work. I challenge anybody to transcend the death of a parent that you love or transcend the death of a child. We don't. We are human. Transcendence is for divine. This whole idea, if somebody was looking for grief and you Google grief, Kubler-Ross comes out very often. It is a wrong idea. This is not how grief works. But people talk about it because it was one of the earliest research. It was done very long time ago. Just because it was done long time ago doesn't mean it was true. So unfortunately, this is not true. So people don't necessarily have to get angry. Neither do people transcend. People manage grief. Okay, you manage grief with your family. You manage grief with the divine. You manage grief by yourself sometimes. Okay? 当我们去上网找这个打这个grief就是悲伤的时候呢，这个理论呢就会出现。可是这个理论很多时候会让人家误以为这个是一个呃悲伤的一个过程，那个其实不是，它是其实是讲说呃关于死亡的一个等过程，
the fact that after so long, I can still grieve my mum. Because it means that my mother was an amazing woman and she had that much of influence in my life. And you know what? I can respect that. And I am more than happy to carry that grief because I'm carrying the love. And I'm not going to forget. I don't want to forget. That's my love for my mother. And I'm sure that is a similar story for most of you. And I'm going to tell you this. Look at it as that is your love for that person. And you put it together with, you know, prayer. You put it together with respect. And you have a relationship that lasts past the physical death. When we feel this love, we often say, sometimes we say this is a relationship that has no end. 我还没有走过这个悲伤。那么，其实很多时候我们不一定要走过这个悲伤、这个哀伤，因为我们会有这个哀伤，是因为我们爱那一个人。所以，我们其实是可以带着这一份哀伤继续去爱这一个人。它是一种爱的一个思念。One of the really beautiful things about having a divinity and spirit in your life is the idea that you have meaning beyond life. So you need to give meaning to the death of an individual in your life. When you give a good meaning, not to their death, but to their life and their life contribution to your life, then they continue living through your deeds. Because ultimately, for people who die, we are their legacy. And if you can create a meaning For their life, then death becomes a moment in their whole life. But if you get caught on only the death, and you forget the meaning of their whole life to you, then you get caught in the grief, and then you get caught in that trap, and you feel lost and alone, because you forget. That what really contributed to you was what they did with you and for you in their life, not just that moment of death. Uh, as a human being, we can, to face death, we can do one thing, to make it meaningful. We can put the focus not only on the death, but on the things that the living person did for us. We can do some things. 把这些事情作为一种啊，建立一种啊不一样的意义，让这一种意义呢转为一种记忆，让我们继续啊生存下去。Now one of the biggest problems with death, especially when we are caregivers, that means we are looking after. Earlier I talked about the sudden death of of children, then there's another death which is the long death, and we look after people in the process of their In the process of them getting sick, in the process of their challenges, in the process of that leads to their death, the caregivers. Uh, 另外一种例子就是，有一些是突发的死亡，有另外一种就是好像我们需要长时间去照顾一个呃患长期患病的一个患者。When you're a caregiver, especially when you're looking after people who are in the process of dying, it gives you a unique identity. 当我们身为一个呃照顾病患的家人的时候，我们呃会是会有一种比较一个特别的一个身份。When we have, when that person was alive, we looked after that person. It gave us a special place in the family. It gave us a purpose. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because I'm looking at the crowd, and I know that many people here may have been in positions of caregiver. May have been the ones who made the sacrifice to look to stay and look after a family member who is sick. 作为照顾者呢，在一个家庭里面会有一个特一个比较特别的一个身份，是因为在世的时候是我去照顾这一个呃病患，是我长期陪伴的这个病患。When we stay and look after a family member who is sick, especially with prolonged sickness, we don't get much praise. In fact, 
We are the ones who become the whipping boys for the family members who hardly even visit. But I'm going to be very frank about this, okay? So I hope you all are up for it. Family members who visit will come and tell you what you should be doing and what you did wrong. And when that person dies, all the guns will point to the most vulnerable person, which is the one who sacrificed and stayed every day to look after. And the guns point and the gun blaze at that person. Why? Because 不会被称赞，而且也很少有其他的亲戚朋友去探望。然而，如果有一些亲戚朋友去探望你的家的时候，他会跟你讲：“哎，你应该这样子做，你不应该这样子做，而没有真正的去同理说，你牺牲了自己
You just have to be that presence. That's why I just now asked you all to be the present, look into each other's eyes. Very hard, right? But if you can be there for that person at that few moments, you'll make the change. When someone is there, the presence to be there, the strength to be there. Well, it was not easy, right? It took a bit of courage to look into people's eyes. That's what is needed in grief, that courage. Okay? Good so luck. Again. Sorry, it's a bit too long. I tried to summarize the whole yes, thing. Summarize. <laughs> I, I sometimes I don't want to break it up. Okay. Uh, 作为这个照顾者, 如果现场有照顾者的话, um, 记得, uh, 不要 被其他人否定你的牺牲，否定你的时间，因为在座的人可能会牺牲了自己的时间、牺牲了自己的身姿的机会，啊，牺牲了跟其他家人啊在一起的一些时间，去招出这个长期病患的人。可是呃，不要被
。如果你有感觉到想哭呢，也是可以哭出来。所以我们除了日常的工作以外，整个过程呢，我们需要花一些时间去经历自己的哀伤。And then you have. I'm just going to do the self-review versus self-judgment. Judgment is God's place, except when we are judging ourselves, and then we are the harshest judge of all. What we don't do, we remember much more than what we did. What we failed at, we remember much more than our successes. We sit down there and we say we are terrible people. What does that mean? You forget every individual here, regardless of your past, regardless of your deeds, you are God's child. Here's my question: Is a child of God worthy of compassion? Is a child of God worthy of love? Are you God's children? Then you are worthy of love, and you're worthy of compassion. So when you sit in judgment of yourself for whatever the history was, then you remove that compassion and you remove that love. One of the things, self-review, is you look at behavior that you can correct. Okay, with this person that passed away, I did not visit enough. Fine. You know what? Never again. Next time, I will make sure I visit. I will make the time. Self-review is I can do something about it. It is correctable. Self-judgment. I did not do it then. When is the then? Ten years ago. When is the then? Twenty years ago, what you cannot change, then you are judging. What you cannot change, you leave in God's hands, and you have to trust in God's compassion, forgiveness, and love. What you can, what you do, change. That is review. Review comes from what I can change now, not what I did in the past. What you did in the past, you remember that you're God's child. You're worthy of compassion. You're worthy of love. You're worthy of forgiveness. All right. When you review, you review for the future. This behavior I did not like then, so now I change the behavior. That is what it means. If we are in self-review, we are in self-improvement stages. If we are in self-judgment, we are guilting. We guilt ourselves. We trap ourselves. We lock ourselves away from love, and that's not what grace is about. That is not what love is about. That is not what healing is about. Okay. 呃，会有两种情况发生，一种就是 self review， 就是自我审查。自我审查的用处呢，就是呃，让我们去看回去，呃，对。死者的一些之前没有做到的，可是以后呢，我们想要去改变一些做法，让未来的生活会可以做到更好，而不要落入这个 self judgment， 就是自我批判，因为自我批判是对于过去的一些做的不好的事情去自责，去啊责骂自己，这个做法是一个不适当的做法，所以我们要留意说，我们要啊时常的自我审查，而不是自我批判。OK。I have no idea what he said. I'm assuming he finished. Okay, <laughs> everybody has been putting up signs for me to finish, 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 and go to Q and A, question and answer, to allow people to ask questions and answers. So just before I go to question and answers, I just want to finish with this one quote from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was a pri was the Prime Minister of、uh, the United Kingdom during World War II, and he had this quote: "If you find yourself in hell, keep walking." See, when you are in grief, it is a form of hell. But if you stop and you give up, not only in grief, in any situation that is negative in life, if you stop and give up, then you are still in hell. You are in hell on earth. 
Keep walking is keep trying. Yes, it's going to be painful. But you're going to have to trust that there is an end. And you're going to have to trust in the love. And you're going to have to trust in the faith. Okay? Last one, you translate that? Then, you can. then we can go Q&A. Uh, never mind. Okay. Q&A now. His mic went and disappeared. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Anasuya. Okay, everyone. When you look at a crowd and everyone is nodding and everyone's connecting to what's being said, that's a wonderful scene to see. Okay, question and answer time. I'm sure you've heard that there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. Okay, quite a pressure, but, but there are quest timely questions. There are questions that you can ask now and it makes sense for all of us to hear. And there are questions that you can choose another space and another place to ask, maybe personally or on your own. So we want to hear your questions, not your story. Oh, my neighbors, mother-in-laws, cats, ca uh, daughter, uh, had this, that. Again. Story us again. Yeah, story you know, again. we want to hear your questions. We have 30 minutes. A lot of people want to ask questions. So, you know, uh, you know bear that in mind. Now... On all sides, you have your crew members and they'll be holding these portable mics. Put your hands up and get their attention and they will direct the mics to you, okay? Okay. Alternatively, if you're shy and you know the crew member's WhatsApp number, send a WhatsApp message to them, ask them to ask the question on your behalf. Okay? That's the other alternative. Any questions? The problem with the question of grief is that in you, when you ask questions, then you feel that people will judge you. Or you feel that people, you're worried about what people are thinking when you ask. Don't. Okay, one question there. Yeah. Uh, what is your way that you overcome, uh, what do you call it, that you heal your process of grief uh, over the death of your mom? Wow. Okay. What was my process of grief? Now, the first thing is I didn't heal very well. I was 22 years old and it went from having a mom in the house to not having a mom in the house and people saying some really stupid things like you have to take your mom's place which of course made me rebel against the idea. Um, so for about six years, I was very angry. I was angry at the whole world. I was angry especially at my dad. Um, you know, I was angry at all kinds of things. And I can still remember that when I used to talk about my mom's death, I'd cry. But the tears were, used to burn my eyes, for the lack of a better word. It used to be very hot tears. It's like a burning sensation in the eye when you cry. Because, you know what? Anger releases its own toxins. So what was happening was that the, 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 the tears never made me feel better. It just actually was me expressing the anger and not the grief. So then what happened is I started doing the Masters in Counseling program about six years after my mom passed away. And I had a big session in a group. And guess who had a wonderful breakdown? Mila. So I had a huge breakdown in front of the first. I actually had a real breakdown in front of people. I didn't understand why. Because it was so long ago, eh? six years ago. Eh? At that point in time, this stupid Kubler Ross thing where you have to get over the death in one year. It doesn't happen. So I had a big breakdown in front of people and then I stopped. Then I stopped and I started... Well, actually no, that's what I did. I stopped. I stopped talking about the anger and I went back and I went through all the pictures in my house and I made a picture album. Not of the death, but of the life. I already had a picture album, but this one was a separate one. I, you know, I took different pictures and I put it together. I did a collage. I did a memory. I started writing. Then I got the story of my mom. Then I realized that what I was doing was not what my mom would have done. It was not the kind of person my mother was. And then I went, no, I'd rather be more like her than more like the angry person I had become. 
So um, then that was when the review happened in terms of how did I look at myself and where did I look at myself. And then before I could stop being angry at the world, I had to admit, and the first person I had to forgive was me. I had to forgive myself for somehow not magically saving my mum. I know, somehow in my head, there was this still idea that I could have done something different to stop, you know, to stop her death. And there was nothing, it was a medical thing. The brain aneurysm, there's nothing literally anybody can do. It doesn't matter, she's my mom, she died early. In my head, magically, I should have been able to stop it. I couldn't. And once I started forgiving myself, then I could recognize the forgiveness around me. And then I could forgive other people. And then you could accept. So the story of grief and the story of actually forgiving others, it actually starts with forgiving yourself. It's actually accepting that I'm a limited human being. There's only so much I can do. With the knowledge and the ability at that time, I tried my best. And you know what? It wasn't good enough, but it's what I had. And I will trust in the compassion of the Lord after that. That's all. It was a process. It took years. It was not fast. You know? That, so that's how I dealt with it. Thank you for asking. Okay? I hope that... Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, Mike here? Can we take this one and behind. Huh? Can we take this one here and then... Okay. That side? Well, somebody come here with the mic. She's next. He first. Okay. Okay. Hi. Just would like to ask, is encounter panic attack, is it one of the process of grief? Yes. A panic attack, if you've never had panic attacks before the grief, if you've never had panic attacks before the loss, panic attacks is a normal part of, unfortunately, it's not normal, but it's one of the more extreme behaviours of grieving, especially when you've never lost anybody before in your life. If that was the first death or the first meaningful death, then the panic attack comes because the death shows you how, as human beings, helpless we are. So then the idea in the back of the head is, I'm hyper-vigilant because somebody else, something may happen to somebody else when I'm not paying attention. So that could bring on panic attacks because suddenly you're feeling like, you know, I can't control anything. And maybe when you're not seeing somebody who you're worried about, it can trigger a panic attack. So yes, it can trigger panic attacks, unfortunately. And that, again, must be managed. It again comes from this idea that we have to control everything. That's where surrender comes in. And then if you can understand the idea of surrender, then that idea of, I can't control anything, so, okay, I can relax. It's in somebody else's hands. That's the strength of prayer. Okay? Uh, yeah, she, uh, so this, this lady first, then behind. Hi, uh, I just have a question. Uh, some people actually, because uh, I lost my father this year, and my actually condolences. some people say stupid things continuously. Yes. Like, uh, like how my father would have wanted to walk me down the aisle, or on the <laughs> what? On my birthday. Um, uh, everybody know what you want is to have your father by your side again. Yeah. And also, a lot of stupid questions continuously coming, backlashing at me. So yeah. how do I overcome it? <sighs> yeah. I, so I, I wish I had a magic bullet for you. I wish I had a magic shield for you. Uh, I don't. All I can say is, you have to understand that human beings, they come from their stupidity. I'm sorry for using the word, but it's true. Um, my dad, one of the reasons why it was very hard for me to forgive my dad was during my convocation, which was uh, you know, one, less than one year after my mom's death, my, my, I was tying the sari and usually you know, everybody is, and you want to tie special saris on that day. My mom was in there and I was having trouble tying the sari. My dad went, oh, all other people can have saris to tie. All other people know how to tie saris. And oh, I, I, know, I felt my, lo my mom's loss so much at that moment because of stupid things people say. So all I can do is, for the people in the room who know this young lady, stop saying stupid things. She knows. She can feel. She doesn't need constant reminders. And the constant reminders 
sometimes come in wrong timing. So for the people in the room, I can say that. For the people who are not in the room, what I can say to you is, the only way to manage it is sometimes shut it off in the ears, like not pay attention and understand that they are coming from their stupidity and their sense of you know, inability to handle. Uh, another one is, uh, you know, sometimes I, kind, I like to imagine, and what I did try to imagine was, I did imagine my mom giving me a hug. You know, my mom coming and, you know, giving me a hug, being next to me and saying, you know, your father is like that, it's okay. You know, so th those are emotions that help. You know, my father is a very loving man. My father is a really great man, a very wonderful man. But just sometimes at that point in time, it was like open mouth, insert foot. Lah. You know, and it's not that, you know, it, he also was going through his own grief. So in that way now I can understand. But when I was in 22, so very hard. So it does get hard. Okay? So I'm very sorry, and uh, you know, just all I can say is maybe at times just feel your dad, and then just go, okay, you know, they don't get it, I get it, that's enough, okay? Yeah, yeah go. We have a question from yes. Maria, all the way Catholic Mission Kuala Trungano. Oh wow, okay, hi. How can we convert grief to sweet memories for the person we lost? How do you convert grief to sweet memories of the person we lost? Stop focusing on the death. Every time we remember a person, if all we remember is the process of them dying and their death, then that's all we can focus on. And that is the most painful times in their life. If there was somebody you had time with before, if there's somebody you spent time with in your lifetime, then those emotions, you should allow space for those stories. The stories for when they were alive. The stories for when they were part of your life. The time when you could spend time with them, how they would respond. Spend time on those stories as much as you spend time on the lost story. Many of us spend a lot of time on the lost story. In fact, we keep repeating it. There are some people, they keep repeating the story of the loss. So, you know, but they forget the story of that came before because those were small stories. The, those were, the, the, you know, the, the, it did not have sometimes the drama of the loss. So that's what you remember. So what I'd say is take out the old picture albums Start telling the stories in those albums. Give each picture a story. And this is where downloading pictures and creating a physical picture album, a physical journal is really good. One of the activity ways you can do it is create that picture album. A physical picture album to look at, not just on your iPad for you to swipe. It's a different feel. It's a different thing when you're holding a picture in your hand versus swiping, 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 okay? So that would be one suggestion that I have for, uh, for the person in Kualtrungano. Okay, thank you for asking. Yeah? We have one question over here, Dr. A. Okay, and then one more here after that. Okay. Um, how do we know uh, if we are grieving? And does grief exist even though we do not think about the person? Yes. Grief can exist when you're not thinking about the person. How do you know you're grieving? Is there a loss in your life? You see, sometimes we run away from it because the world tells us grieving is wrong. We are supposed to be happy. Positive psychology. Supposed to be happy, no? Actually, no. We are supposed to manage all our emotions. Every emotion is part of the human experience. Grief, loss, all of it is part of that experience. And we go through that process of doing normal stuff and in the back of our heads, we've still lost that person. And then at times when you remember, you remember. So if you're feeling that you're not sure whether it's grief or whether it's depression, give yourself a space for grieving. And you, but you know that you've lost somebody. And this loss may not be the person died. It can be the person has moved out of your life. It can be through divorce. It can be through the person is overseas and you, know, you never see them again. You've lost contact, various things. It's a breakup, whatever. 
If you think that that may be a contributing factor, and it's like you're not sure whether it's a depression, then take that one out, take, an, take, take some time of the day, sit down with yourself, and have a conversation with the person who's gone. See whether that's the issue. Give yourself space to grieve. And if in that space for grieving, none of the grief comes up. Instead, it is actually, it's just about me, it's I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling really down, it's not about anybody else, then it's something different. But in order to figure that out, you need to give yourself space to see whether it's about, the, it's about somebody's loss or to see whether it's about my own situation right now. So that would be a suggestion. Okay? Okay. Uh, this side had a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my husband passed away just seven months. Oh my, I'm okay. so sorry. And uh, I, when I finish my seven days prayers, there's an elderly man from my BECs, and he told me that, you know, David has provided you everything, you have everything. So you just live with it, you don't find anyone, you know. And I told him that I haven't decided anything. You know, I feel so hurt. And some people, they ask me to dress well. When I dress well, also it's become wrong. Their, their mind thinks wrong. But I don't want to show my sadness to everyone. I try to control, so I grew myself. But only me who will know the grief. But why people are like that? I really don't understand. And just finish your 40 days of prayers also, they can say, oh, she haven't really seen. Is that so easy to release? Because my husband's dad is sudden dead. If he fall in sick for many few months, maybe I can prepare myself. But his death was a sudden. And we both married 21 years. We are so loving. You know? Okay. I am so sorry that your experience are with really, really heartless people. I... This is judgment by people who do not understand and are playing and are pretending to know better than other people, holier than thou. What was done to this, to this lady was not done with any sense of spirit, with any sense of humanity. If there's nothing else you'll learn from this session, learn when to keep this quiet. It is a weapon that in times of grief is a freaking nuclear bomb. And you cause so much of damage, it's not funny. Okay? So if nothing else you'll learn, please learn that. Pray with people. That's it. Whatever else you want to say, save it. They don't need to hear it. You don't need to give them gems of wisdom on how to live their life. That's between them and God. All right? You deal with your own issues. Ma'am? Look good. That's what your husband would have wanted for you. Take your time. Take your time and live your life as you want to live your life. Because your husband, like you said, he wanted what is best for you. And until the time when you go, he still wants what's best for you. Never judge how much somebody is grieving by crying or not crying during an event. I have been through enough loss in my life to know that I didn't cry so much. Why? Because if I cried, the whole world breaks down. I have a younger sister, I have a younger brother, I have people around, and if I had broken down, 
you would have watched everybody break down. So I did not have the luxury of crying. I didn't have the luxury of breaking down. But there were people who judged me based on that. And I did not care. But that was part of the anger, the judgment that people face, that people gave. People look good because they remember that that's what that person wanted for me. This is how I want to be in my relationship with my departed. Some of the people that cried the most during some of the funerals I know were not crying in grief. They were crying in guilt. And everybody congregated around that one person, oh, you poor thing, because you're crying so much. But the people who were really hurting were not crying because they were busy doing work, they were busy organizing, they were busy getting things done, they were busy protecting family members. So do not judge again whether somebody is crying or the person that looks the worst or they are the ones who are grieving the most. No, that's not how it works. Most people in deep grief can't cry in public. It's very hard. And shock will stop you from crying altogether. Okay? So you need to understand these different processes. And I want to acknowledge your, deep, your grief is very deep and your love is very deep. Use the love for the healing. Right? Thank you very much for sharing, ma'am. That was very useful for everybody else. Thank you. Okay? Morning, doctor. Morning. I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Thank you very much for the sharing. My pleasure. My question is, what about the issue of detachment? Detaching oneself with the ones we love. Like we are all creatures of attachment. Mm -hmm. we, we cling on to things that we are not supposed to cling on to. So, by reminding ourselves to detach with the help of prayer, yeah. do you think it will minimize grief? Thank you. It depends on you. And like I said, it depends on your relationship with God and your relationship with the people who've passed on. For some people, the idea of detachment works. If I, you know, I need to detach myself and only attach myself to divine, fine. But for other people, love works. I don't just love the people who are living, I love everybody who's ever been in my life. And when I love, it means I hurt. And I will bear the hurt. So the idea of detachment comes based on your relationship with the people who've passed on and your relationship with the divine. Based on your relationship, if detachment works for you, then use that. But understand for other people, love is the language that they work. And love can be very involved. It can be very involved with even people who've passed on or people who are alive. So it's a different type of relationship. It's a different type of uh, caring for people. It's a different type of healing process. There's no one shoe fits everybody. There's no one emotion suits everybody. You just must, we need to, in the least, not judge and respect how people go through the emotional state. The hardest one you have in families is when husband and wife, and they both have different styles of dealing with the loss. One is detached, one is emotional, one is very loving. So when these two clash and it's a loss of a child, it is the highest predictor of divorce following a death of a child. Because they don't speak the same language, they don't grieve in the same way, so they both drift apart. So that's when counsellors and all are needed to help them speak to each other in a way they understand that both are grieving. But both are grieving in different ways. And this can happen in any family. Okay? I hope I answered the question. Uh, I think one or two more questions only. Yeah? Doctor, uh, can I have your permission to share something with the lady who, who just shared the story just now? My, by all means. Okay. My name is Sean. Um, I lost my dearest late father and mother some 18 years ago. But to me, it happened yesterday. Yep. We also lost a son. My wife and I, we lost our son uh, some seven years ago. Um, the way we cope... The way we cope with it is this. Um, in my father's case, 
they were people. I, I cared for my father, bathed, clean, wash, fed. So there were people who were judgmental. There was this auntie who wrote me a long letter and said, hey, you were wrong in sleeping next to your father and facing your bum to him. You see? So to me, I called up that auntie and I said, excuse me, it was my honour to spend my last few days next to my father's casket. I slept yes. next to him. Yes. So I, I decided at that point of time that I would compartmentalise my, my, my life and my grief, that I would not allow these people to tell me wrong things. Maybe they don't mean it. Yeah. You see, sometimes they don't mean it, they just say the wrong things. Yep. So just to compartmentalise and tell myself, okay, I'm going to do things differently. I'm not going to attend funerals because that's when they say the wrong things. I am not going to attack and um, defend myself all the time. When I send the memorial into the Herald, I will not remember the day they died. I remember the anniversary, both my parents. Yeah. So I put in the anniversary, the wedding anniversary. Okay. So it, it's coping, the coping mechanism, Very trying good. to be, you know, Thank flexible you for there. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. There's, we have different ways of coping and we have different ways and just remember that people are stupid. Okay? And if we can remember that they are stupid and they're speaking from their stupidity and not their heart, then maybe we can be... Well, we can step back away from their stupidity. Okay? That would be an easy way of putting it. Uh, I think last question of the, of the day because the people before they... Yeah. Yeah, so one question. One question, please. One question, last question. Any, anybody who's got a last question? Uh, if not, we can finish. Oh, there's somebody here. Where? Give the mic. Uh, oh, so me, okay. Um, oh, they're behind. Okay, whoever's got the mic first, I'm sorry. If not, you can come and ask me afterwards. Yeah. So there's, the person has got a question there. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning, doctor. Yes. <clears throat> uh, in your lecture, you said that the funeral rites is actually for the living, yeah. not for the dead. I wish you could have elaborated more on that. Now, my question is, when <clears throat> in Malaysia, like we have been attending the funeral rites of Hindus, uh, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Christian, the Catholics and the Protestants. Okay. And the rites differ. Like if it is a Hindu rite, it's very rich. Yeah. But how does this customary rite help the family actually? Okay, remember when, we, when I said earlier that we do two things. We have the... We, at the times we are processing the death and at times we are processing the emotions. The funeral rites gives people a time when the family congregates together. The family comes together and they work together and there's a sense of what do I need to do next in order to move forward. And people have a clear idea, at least for that few days, of what they need to do next. One of the more brilliant things about the, the Hindu rites is the idea of um, the, f the family doesn't need to cook because there are a lot of expenses related to, uh, to, uh, to funerals when people die. And during the times of the Indian, the Indian custom is at that time, people bring food almost every day for a certain period of time. And that would have revealed, relieved the financial burden of the family. That is part of what I'm saying when I say that the funeral rites are for the living. The funeral rites also help the living, give them a sense of, like, for this period of time, I have a guide, a map, for at least the first few days of the loss. I have a map on what to do, what I'm supposed to do, who I can turn to. So all these help people manage. Beyond that, there's a sense of, I can do something for this person. Because once a person is dead, the only thing you can do is the rites. The only thing you can do is manage how to manage those. And sometimes that's where the idea of I want to give my loved one a good death. I, could, that, I couldn't do much in their life because I was too young or whatever, but I can give them a good death. Um, I, can co I can give you examples of people who have experienced a family rights and they said, oh no, they didn't do everything correctly. I didn't like how they did it. And they went, some of them went to, to India, some of them went uh, to, uh, to their to a different church like in Penang and all that and they redid the whole funeral just with them attending and the priest and the father. They redid the whole funeral for their loved ones because it is about what they are offering to the spirit of that person and so it's, it's a personal thing. For some people, doing uh, 
you know, even every anniversary, making a big deal out of the anniversary of the death or the anniversary of the wedding or some anniversary where it's a special day where you remember, Cheng Beng, it's a special day to remember and to go and give respect. That is the brilliance of it. Because our sense of gratitude, our sense of love, our sense of respect is what makes us human. We balance the grief by giving these emotions. And honestly, our ancestors did have it right. Having this respect, this filial piety, this, you know, this, this time we give to our loved ones, even those who have passed, it creates that gratitude which is so healing in our lives. It creates that love. Okay? So my final words, because I think I'm over time now, is uh, thank you all very much for giving me the time and the space. I know it's a heavy topic. I apologize for any mistakes or missays I might have said that might have hurt somebody's feeling or you feel that I said something wrong. I'm only human and I will make mistakes. So please, forgiveness for any mistakes I did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anasuya. I think we've all felt supported and taken through this very difficult topic um, with kindness. Thank you. Uh, we would like to, from the Archdiocese and Mental Health Ministry, uh, give you a small gift. Can I invite Father Philip to please present this small token of appreciation for an amazing, amazing session. Okay, everyone, now we need to um, move in an efficient fashion. The first thing that needs to happen is we need to get all the crew members and facilitators for the children's workshop. Can you please come to the front? All the crew members and facilitators for the children's workshop, please come to the front. Okay. Everyone get a good look at these faces, especially parents who are sending your children for the workshop. Okay?